What makes it incredibly reactive? It is charged. What charge is it? Negative. So it is negative because it has extra electrons. What things have extra electrons? Nucleophiles. Nucleophiles and bases. Okay, so anytime we see an H minus, we're thinking of those two potential categories. Okay. Hydride in and of itself is insanely tiny. Okay. So we might lean towards it being a really good nucleophile. Okay. It becomes a better nucleophile if it's small because it can work into the middle of the structure where the electrophile is located. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but there are some pretty big limitations on that. And that limitation really has to do with how reactive hydride is. It is very, very, very tiny. It's not easy to stabilize. To stabilize it, what would we need to supply? At least temporarily. A positive, right? Which we saw before, we could throw in something like sodium. Okay, we have an ionic bond, the sodium is positive, the hydride is negative, we still have our hydride. Okay, and we might say, well, now we have the potential for a nucleophile and a base. But as we addressed, sodium hydride in the ionic bond is so still incredibly reactive okay, and unstable that it does not dissolve in organic solvents. Because it doesn't dissolve, the only place that sodium hydride can react is on the surface of the hydride surface itself, which means what we're looking at is something that is effectively insanely large. Okay? So even though we're looking at something that appears to be small, it is actually sterically hindered, or sterically massive, if we wanted to consider. If it is sterically massive, I can spell that one. Right. Sterically massive. And because of that, it can't act as a nucleophile. That means it's solely going to act as a base. I can't spell anything today. Only a base. Okay. What else could we potentially put near that hydride to stabilize it? Well, it's something that's positive. Okay. If it's a metal, we're in the same boat, only a base. We want something that can potentially stabilize that hydrogen so that it can act as an H minus, which we've seen already. We could put that hydride next to a boron, as we saw with our electrophilic additions, okay, with the reagent BH3. Okay. In the process of that, the hydride attacks the forming carbocation of our alkene. The boron picks up the electrons from the alkene. And we add hydrogen and boron across a pi bond. Okay. It looked like I had some quizzical faces. So let's go ahead and show that real quickly. Right? We end up adding a negative hydrogen in that course of that reaction. We've also seen our boron in the form of BH4 minus sodium borohydride. We're now adding two things to help stabilize that negative hydrogen. We're adding a sodium and the boron. Okay? Sodium borohydride is a much stronger hydride source because there's more of them and more charge built into that hydride. Okay. The other option ends up being just something similar to it. We can switch to lithium. And instead of boron, we'll go aluminum with our hydride. Okay. So those are the two major reagents when we're looking at hydrides, in particular reacting with our polar pi bonds. If we move to our next slide, we've got those two shown. Okay. Both of them are reacting on the same species. Okay. We're going through, we're adding hydrogen uh, or a hydride to the carbonyl carbon, and we end up adding a hydrogen to the oxygen. Uh, that hydrogen comes from our solvent, sort of. That hydrogen comes from the solvent in the first reaction. Where does the hydrogen come from in the second reaction? 
The hydrogen attached to the oxygen. The what? Proton it's a proton transfer. It's coming from the acid. Okay, or H3O plus. Okay. So what are the differences that we see between these two reactions? The longer you wait, the harder the difference becomes, by the way. The top one, all the reagents are together. And okay. The so there's the easiest one. The bottom one is two-step. Top one is all meshed together in one reaction. Okay. So that is the biggest difference between these. Okay. What else? Fair enough. I hadn't even considered that. We have an effectiveness behind these. We have to be a little bit careful with that because that's going to be for this particular reaction. So there are cases where lithium aluminum hydride is more effective than sodium borohydride. What else do we see as differences? Um, for the lithium aluminum, there's an ether in it. Okay. The solvent for when the lithium or hydride reagent showed up for the lithium aluminum hydride is ether. What's the solvent in step or the first reaction? Okay, we're looking at ether, and we're looking at water. What's the difference between those solvents? One's organic. Okay, I'll accept organic. What else? What do you mean? Keep going. Ether is more... Ether is more... More nonpolar. Nonpolar and polar. Officially, ether is polar, though. Okay, so the non is correct. It's less polar uh, than water. So we'll put that in parentheses. What else could we add in there? Water is a protic solvent. Back to our two steps. The lithium aluminum or hydride required two steps, right? Okay. We had to bring in a hydrogen in step two. Why do we have to bring in a step two for hydrogen? What's our solvent for lithium aluminum hydride? Ether, which is aprotic. There isn't a hydrogen source. Why in sodium borohydride do I not need a second step? The solvent I'm using is a hydrogen source. Okay. So we can evaluate and start to compare those differences. Okay. What else could we look at? So that's a good question that's pushing it a step further. First, we want to address our differences between these two reactions. So the two-step one was, I think, an easy comparison, two versus one. We had a push to looking at the solvents, which I would argue is a, a harder one. Uh, we had to push at our yields, which is questionable to evaluate, but they at least are different here. Okay. I think there's a, another couple really big ones. Did see some people looking at the periodic table. Sodium is a group one metal, right? What is lithium? Group one metal. And yet, I'm using different group one metals. That's the difference between these two reactions, right? One uses lithium, one uses sodium. Okay, so there's a hint or a difference. What's another difference? Boron, and aluminum. Boron versus the aluminum as the thing to stabilize our hydride. Okay. Boron is a group. 3A, if we want to go there. Metal and lithium is a group 3A. So they're the same type 
of element. They're in the same family, but their chemistry is different, right? We're seeing a different, or not necessarily different, but we're doing the same chemistry with a different atom, okay? Why change the atom? Okay. Well, a lot of that's going to go back to this statement of noticing why am I allowed to use a polar product solvent in one but not in the other? Well, what can you tell me about polar protic solvents? All right, let's pick some uh, drastic examples. I'm going to pick a polar protic solvent of HCl versus a polar non or a non-polar a protic solvent of methane. Is there a difference in chemistry there? Yeah, what's that difference in chemistry? Acid versus not. Okay. What's the difference between water and ether? What chemistry does water have access to that ether does not? It has an acidic hydrogen. Okay. Why might that be important? Well, what reagent are we adding in this? Both sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride were all about supplying Hydride. What charge was that hydride? Negative. A negative. And as why is just suggesting, can act as a base. What is different about the two reagents? Well, sodium borohydride is allowed to run in a polar protic solvent. Lithium aluminum hydride is not. What does that mean? Say that again. One is more reactive than the other. Which one's more reactive? The lithium aluminum hydride. I cannot run the lithium aluminum hydride in a protic solvent because what happens? The lithium aluminum hydride starts to act as a base, react with the acid of the solvent, and it kills the reagent. Sodium borohydride, on the other hand, can be put into a water environment because it's less reactive. It won't react with it. It'll still react as a nucleophile with our carbonyl. Right? So there's a pretty drastic differential in their reactivity. Sodium borohydride is much less reactive than the lithium aluminum hydride. Okay? So now the question might become, why? Why is lithium aluminum hydride more reactive than sodium borohydride? We break them down, they're ultimately all coming back to the same kind of thing. Notice we are showing a trigonal planar structure there, which is officially wrong. But we can kind of pretend. We've got our hydride chilling out there in that p orbital in both cases. Why is lithium aluminum hydride more reactive than boro sodium borohydride? Isn't it the same structure? Aluminum is larger. Okay, that's an interesting idea. How does that affect the reactivity? Is this drawing now valid where they're the same? No. What would I need to do to change it? The p orbital for boron is a 2p orbital. What's the p orbital for aluminum? Not 2p. Ouch, man. 130, man. 3p. Third row, okay, which makes it the third energy level. It's the first within the p block, right? You remember all that vaguely? Okay. What is the difference between a 2p orbital and a 3p orbital? It has nothing to do with electrons. The size, the 3p orbital is in the third energy level, which means it's larger. Okay. If it is now larger, what happens to the bond distance between the hydride and the aluminum? It gets longer. 
which then means what about the hydrogen? It is more likely to be removed. It is further from the structure. It becomes more active. So by increasing the length of that bond, our hydride becomes more reactive. Cool. Okay. That's our difference between aluminum and boron. Is there something else we could look at as a difference between aluminum and boron? Electronegativity. What is the difference in electronegativity between boron and aluminum? Boron is more electronegative, which means what's happening? It is holding the hydrogen electrons a little bit tighter than the lithium aluminum hydride, which means those hydride electrons are now less reactive because the boron is more electronegative. It's holding those tighter. So if we go through and make an elemental analysis, we can start to see why we get those differences in those results okay, or in those experiments. The lithium aluminum hydride is much more reactive than the sodium borohydride. In the analysis we just looked at, really I should just be referring to these as aluminum hydride and borohydride. Is there another difference between them? It's lithium versus sodium. What's our difference between lithium and sodium? Size. Lithium is smaller, and sodium is larger. Both of them are what? Metals. Both of them have what charge? Plus one. Is that plus charge doing anything to our hydride? Probably not. So what should that positive charge be reacting with if it's not reacting with the hydride? A what? Could try and react to the center atom. It's in the in what center atom? The aluminum. And you're saying that because we have the negative charge on those atoms, right? But remember, those center atoms want only three bonds. The electrons are actually kicking out on the hydrogen, not on the center atom. Okay. So the lithium and the sodium aren't associated with, or the lithium, yeah, and the sodium aren't associated with the aluminum and the boron. Well, if we aren't looking at that association, what would they do to potentially change this reaction? React with what base? Hydride. Lithium or the hydride? But we just said it's not reacting with the hydride. React with something in the solvent? Reacting with something in the solvent doesn't necessarily speed the reaction. So it's not a bad idea. You're now fishing for something else. Good. You should be fishing into the solution, and you just happen to grab at the solvent, which was not the one we should be looking at. What should we be looking at? What else is in a solution if it's not the solvent and it's not the reagent? We could call it the substrate. Right? What functional group was that? A carbonyl. Could the carbonyl somehow be interacting with the lithium and the sodium? Okay. Well, if we think about how our reaction works, what's that hydride reacting with? The electrophilic carbon. The electrophilic carbon. Why do we know that carbon is electrophilic? Because the oxygen is... Right? What could the lithium or the sodium possibly interact with? The oxygen. Why is size going to matter here? If lithium is interacting with that oxygen, that bond is relatively short, making that interaction stronger, which then does what to the carbonyl? Further polarizes it. By being further polarized, we see an increase in reactivity with the lithium aluminum hydride over the sodium borohydride. So the counter ion, our metal ion, is also contributing to the reactivity difference here. I thought somebody else had a question. Does that make sense? Right. Bottom line, what do you need to know? 
Lithium aluminum hydride reacts a lot. Sodium borohydride, not as much. Right? They're both doing the same thing. They're adding hydride to a carbonyl. Right? So what we're trying to do is identify those differences and just kind of move through them. Okay? What does that mean for our reagent conditions? Like our solvent choice. Well, if lithium aluminum hydride has a more active hydride, what do I want to do? Okay. What does that mean for our reagent conditions, our solvent choice? Lithium aluminum hydride has a much more active hydride than the sodium borohydride. What should that mean about the solvent? Lithium aluminum hydride can't use polar product solvents. If there's a polar product solvent, it kills the reagent, and I don't get the nucleophilic addition, okay? because it is more active. So more active, I need nonpolar, or sorry, I'll still need polar solvents. Why polar? What kind of bond is there between lithium and aluminum hydride? It's an ionic bond. As an ionic bond, we need something to solubilize those ions. If it's nonpolar, will it solubilize? No. So it still needs to be polar. Right? So the lithium aluminum hydride is being more active. I need right, a polar A product solvent. The sodium borohydride, Germany. The sodium borohydride can use polar protic solvents. Right. When we look at the reaction, yes, we're adding hydride, but we're also adding hydrogen ion. We're adding an H plus to that oxygen. In the case of sodium borohydride, I can get H plus from my protic solvent. Can I do that from the lithium aluminum hydride? No, I don't have a protic source. If I had a protic source, I wouldn't have the lithium aluminum hydride. So what does that necessarily mean? It must occur or must be two steps. And the sodium borohydride is okay with one step. which are those pieces that we went through and saw already. How to make sense? So we're identifying those differences and then saying, how does that affect our overall reaction? And we can start to draw conditions or predictions about it. Right? If we go through and look at lithium aluminum hydride with a protic solvent, that reaction happens insanely fast to form hydrogen gas. With sodium borohydride, because that is a stronger boron hydrogen bond, does not happen so quickly with the protic solvent, which means the borohydride has more opportunity to act as a nucleophile instead of the acid-base reaction. And I get the, the nucleophilic addition instead of the acid base. How that make sense? Okay. What does this mean for our nucleophilic addition? So let's go through and take a look at those reagents. What do you see in common for all of those reagents? Okay, I accept a pi bond. I don't quite accept a carbonyl because the last two aren't carbonyls. Okay. Uh, but I think we can do better than a pi bond because I don't see an alkene or an alkyne. Whoops, that's not an alkyne. Man. Or an alkyne. So those aren't on the list. So I don't accept just pi bond. They are all polar pi bonds, which is what I can do with a, or use with a nucleophilic addition. Okay. What is the difference between any of those? So pick any two you want. Just tell me which two. So we can number them left to right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Four and five. Probably the two hardest to evaluate. But that's okay. <sighs> it's 
It's day Friday yet. Oh, good luck in lab, guys. <laughs> so four and five. What can you tell me? Yeah. What can you tell me about those two? What's your difference? Okay. So our difference is not so much the double bond, but oxygen versus nitrogen. What's our difference between oxygen and nitrogen? Oxygen is more electronegative. Oxygen is more electronegative, which means what happens to the bond in four? And just in case, this one. It is more polar, which means what am I generating in that one more so than in five? A larger partial positive. With a larger partial positive, what happens? It can be expected to be more reactive, which then means if it's more reactive, I could expect to use a lower activity hydride source than I could for this one. That's what we're trying to get at within this delineation. It turns out lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride uh, both work equally well with all of these. Okay. So they will go through and reduce all of them. We get some special cases. Number one is a special case. Okay. Uh, and the last one is kind of a special case. Okay. Nitrogen being less reactive really needs lithium aluminum hydride to force that reaction because these are less reactive. Okay. I believe the borohydride will also react to the nitrile, but I'm not positive on that one. Okay. But what is an extra special case about that last one? Triple bond. A triple bond. Why is that an issue? We said they all had in common what? Polar pi bond. What is a triple bond? It has two polar pi bonds, which means it could potentially react twice. Okay. And again, I'm not positive on this one, but I think I might be right. Sodium borohydride can't react Lithium aluminum hydride will react twice. Okay. That's how reactive lithium aluminum hydride is. Okay. And if I'm right, should have a nice little drawing underneath. No, I'll just say there's something about reactivity. Oh, yeah. Boom. Look at that. Memory. It worked for once. Okay. Sodium borohydride will take out all of those it can't touch the nitrile. Okay. The nitrile isn't polar enough out of the gate. Okay. Why is the nitrile less polar than the imine? What is different between 5 and 6? There's a hybridization effect. The carbon in your nitrile is sp hybridized, which means it is more electronegative, which means that bond becomes less polar, which makes it less reactive. Sodium borohydride can't react with it. Lithium aluminum hydride, being so stupidly reactive, will react with all of those. Okay? And it will, and this is something that's in your homework, it will actually react with this one twice. If you draw out a mechanism, you might be like, well, that's a bit weird because I end up with a negative 2 nitrogen in there. Yes, that's how reactive lithium aluminum hydride is. You can form an atom with a negative 2 charge. Okay. Okay. Preview into chapter 20. All right, let's go ahead and start this one off with naming each of those functional groups. Feel free to shout them out all at once. Ketone, good guess. Hi, right, guys. Hello. Next one. It's an ester. And the next one? It's 
and acyl chloride. All of them have carbonyls. What is the big difference that the last two, or what is the big difference that the last two bring into the picture? They all have that polar pi bond, right? Carbonyl. What is different that the ester and the acyl chloride also bring in? Hearing something about more electronegative. Yeah. The ester and the acyl chloride both are leaving groups. Okay. If we go ahead and throw lithium aluminum hydride at these, the hydride attacks, kicks out the leaving group, we still have a polar pi bond. So what happens? It'll react a second time. Okay. That nucleophilic addition and then elimination of the leaving group is the next mechanism. That's preview of chapter 20. That's a nucleophilic addition followed by an elimination. So we'll come back to these reagents again when we look at those new functional groups. Okay. So hydrogen nucleophiles, there we go. There's some practice. Go ahead and work through those. If you've got questions, raise your hand. I'll come to you. So we've got one, two, three, four. Questions. One, two, three, and four. Tell me what the products are. So if we go ahead and start with the first one, okay. A couple of people drew attention to it because they noticed, like the one right next to it looked almost identical. Like, well, why would you give the exact same question? But they did look at least closer and noticed that I did not give the exact same question. What's the difference? Steps. In the first example, I did not put them as separate steps. That's all in one solution. Okay. Lithium aluminum hydride has to go into its own solution without a protic solvent. If a protic solvent is present, it reacts as a base, not as a nucleophile. And so what ends up happening is that these two react with each other to form hydrogen gas. Now I have no more lithium aluminum hydride. The carbonyl doesn't change. And the next one, because I've done it in two steps, the hydride can be used to go through and react and add to the carbonyl, giving me my O negative. Okay. There's now no positives floating around. Now I can add in step two of the dilute hydrochloric acid. That neutralizes that negative oxygen and places the hydrogen. Okay. Now I've done the nucleophilic addition. Next one down, kind of boring. I don't even want to draw out the ring. All we're doing is adding hydrogen across the pi bond. Okay. Last one. I want the starting material now. So I need... Well, the ring didn't do anything. Chemistry is all happening out here. Okay. Sodium borohydride will make alcohols from... Whoops, I think I missed a carbon. No, I didn't. Carbon, there it is. And I now have my answer. Okay. At this stage in the game, we don't really have a large difference between lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride, except that lithium aluminum hydride we know to be more reactive. That's it. Okay. And so a question would come up, well, then why would I ever use sodium borohydride? If lithium aluminum hydride always works, let's just use that. There are synthetic cases where that will become a problem because the lithium aluminum hydride will react with everything. The borohydride will only react with one thing. Okay. The other thing to kind of add into this is that when we're picking out reagents to run a synthesis, we want to pick the weakest reagent that still does the job. Okay. And you might say, well, that seems kind of silly. I would bet you've all done this. Okay. If we wanted to hammer a nail into a wall or put a nail into a wall, okay, would a wrecking ball get the nail into the wall? Yes. How many of you have used a wrecking ball to do so? Because it probably does it faster than a hammer would. Right? So let's just use wrecking balls to put nails into walls. Okay. Lithium aluminum hydride is the wrecking ball in this case. Okay. Sodium borohydride is a little bit more delicate. It gets the job done. 
there could be potential other side repercussions with using a wrecking ball, but again, the same kind of idea. Okay? We want the weakest reagent that still does what it needs to. Lithium borohydride is kind of our standard right now for the best choice. Okay? At this point, really the only questions that you'll get asked will be, could I use lithium aluminum hydride in this alcohol solvent? No, because an alcohol solvent is protic. Okay? So really the only differential we've got is looking at the solvent right now. We don't really distinguish what they're reacting with. The next part is our carbon nucleophiles, okay? So let's list some methods to get some carbon nucleophiles. Okay. In theory, these were all methods uh, that you've already done. And I was really hoping I had all the answers, but I can think of three, four, you know two of which. Maybe, yeah, let's see what you got. What's a method to get a carbon nucleophile? Okay. So we'll draw on the Grignard. The reason why that one's a trickier reagent is because we haven't talked about it yet. So that becomes a trickier one. What's happening with the Grignard? To get a negative carbon, okay, carbon had to take electrons from something. And this is one of the reasons why carbon nucleophiles are not easy to make. How do I get a carbon to take electrons from something? Well, attach it to a metal, like magnesium. Okay? Magnesium being a metal will give up its electrons readily to the carbon, and I now have a nucleophilic carbon. Okay? So I do have that way to get a carbon nucleophile. How else could I get a carbon nucleophile? Carbon. What's that? Carbon. Snap. I hadn't thought of that one. We get the carbene. No one ever remembers the carbene, right? Except apparently Farzan. <laughs> Sorry, Farzan. I'm not trying to call you out. Anybody remember the carbene? Okay. It was both a nucleophile because of the lone pair and an electrophile because it had an empty p orbital. Weird, goofy, goofy chemistry, but that gave us our ring structure. So carbene's fair game, which unfortunately, sorry everybody, there are two more that I know you know. One of which is really review from first semester. The other one we talked about, what is today, Wednesday? We talked about on Monday. Strong base won't work very well, right? The reason being is that a carbon-hydrogen bond is relatively strong. It's nonpolar. So just saying a strong base isn't enough detail for me to say, yeah, you're right, because that strong base isn't going to remove the hydrogen. Okay. I would argue that to get number one, a strong base is important, but I need some more context to be able to accept that as a valid answer. They're lines, right? We could play Hangman. Where's the people that actually like to play games? Nobody likes to play games. Hey, cool, thank you. Have the enol chemistry, right? That carbonyl, we can remove that hydrogen using a strong base, okay? But we need the context of why we can break that hydrogen off. I can break that off because I get resonance back with the carbonyl. So I needed that extra piece. 
Okay, so believe it or not, one is also looking at a strong base. Let's see, did I actually put it together right? Whoa, look at that. We can get the acetylide. What is the acetylide? It's looking at a triple bond. I can use a strong base to remove that hydrogen. Why will a strong base remove that hydrogen? As a hint, resonance is not the answer. This is now the acetylide. Very particularly, I have to use sodium amide. Can't use sodium hydroxide. Why is that bond allowed to be broken, but a standard carbon hydrogen is not? I can't do the same thing with, say, CH4. Elaborate. It's a acidic hydrogen because of the triple bond. Why? Why is that uh, why is that other carbon pulling? Yes. It's more electronegative. It's a hybridization effect again. The carbon is more electronegative because it is less hybridized. It has more S character. It can draw electron density away from that hydrogen. It's an electronegativity effect that explains why we can form the acetylide and we now have that negative. Okay. So we have these methods. Okay. We will pick up another one known as a Gilman reagent. Okay. So if you remember your Gs, that usually helps out okay, for your carbon nucleophiles. Okay. Why is it difficult to make carbon nucleophiles? Carbon's not super electronegative, which means for it to become negative or hold electrons, something it has to be bonded to something that is willing to give up its electrons. That's not easy to do if you're carbon at the bottom of the electronegativity scale. Okay? It's also not large, so it can't stabilize those electrons well on its own either. Okay? So carbon nucleophiles are not easy to make. And this is one of the reasons why when we make them, i.e. the Grignard and the Gilman, we attach the name of the person that discovered them to that reagent. Okay? So, uh, our organometallics, there's really two pathways to do this. We can refer to them as the Grignard reagent and organolithium reagents. Okay? The Grignard reagent is very specifically a carbon nucleophile that is formed after a reaction with magnesium, okay? which may seem a bit odd, because magnesium is a metal, and we would expect magnesium to be a plus two charge. How in the world does carbon steal electrons from bromine in the presence of a plus two magnesium metal? Okay. The trick is that it's not a plus two magnesium. It's elemental magnesium. It has two electrons. It goes through a complex mechanism known as the set mechanism, or SET, for single electron. electron transfer. It's a radical mechanism where we're transferring electrons one at a time from the magnesium metal up into the organo uh, alkyl halide compound. That inserts the magnesium between the carbon and the bromine. That's where our electrons are ultimately coming from. So what we are looking at is a negative carbon and then a positive 2 magnesium and still a negative bromide. The bromide still holds its standard negative charge. Okay. We can run a similar process with lithium as a reagent. Lithium reacts a little bit faster and easier um, because it's the alkaline metal, alkali metal, alkali metal, as opposed to an alkaline earth. Okay, either case, you're getting a carbon nucleophile. Okay, so rare, useful, and tricky. Why is it rare? 
It's a negative carbon. That's not easy to make. Okay? Why is it rare? How often do you mix elemental magnesium or lithium with organic reagents? Okay? Particularly organic halides. This is kind of a random chance happening discovery. Okay? Why is it useful? You have a carbon nucleophile. Why does it become tricky? We do have to use the proper reagents to go through and do it. As, as we'll find within the lab, it is difficult to generate the Grignard reagent because there are some very special conditions that must go with it, which is our tricky. Anytime you have a nucleophile, you also run the risk of a base. Turns out the Grignard reagent, being a negative carbon, is not a stable, happy thing to be, which means if there's any protic hydrogens around, what happens? It immediately reacts as a base, not as a nucleophile, and it kills the whole reaction process. We end up losing activity because we started at an alkyl halide. We go to a Grignard reagent. If we're in the presence of an acidic environment, we then replace the bromine with hydrogen, and we go all the way down to an alkane. So we start at intermediate chemistry, go drastically higher to try and get it to act as a nucleophile, and instead, because we screwed up our lab technique, we go to even lower than the low as far as our chemical reactivity. So we have to be careful when dealing with Grignard reagents to make sure we are not near anything remotely acidic. So those of you in the lab, or the, really those of you not in the lab, okay, we have to be very meticulous with our glassware. One of those meticulous things is we heat the crap out of our glassware. Why are we heating up our glassware? To get the water off of it. You're like, well, but it's Arizona. It dried. There's enough water in the atmosphere due to us being in the building that that will kill the Grignard reaction. Yeah. So that's why it needs to go into the oven because we're trying to cook and drive off all of that water right, and make sure it doesn't get into our reaction. The actual formation of the Grignard reagent you're not responsible for, but I think it's kind of neat, so I just want to look at it real quickly. Okay. So the way it starts is magnesium gives up a single electron. Okay. That single electron gets stolen from the carbon-bromine bond. Notice we have to have three arrows to generate this. We end up with now a radical uh, phenyl, and we have radical magnesium. What then happens? We get the two radicals combining to give us our Grignard reagent. Okay. It is a single electron transfer because we're using half-headed arrows to go through and generate the reaction. How do we know that it is single-headed arrows and not, say, a full dump of the electrons from magnesium? One of the byproducts that we get for this reaction at least as shown, is this. The only way we make that is if we had radicals. If we had, a, what is it, the heterolytic bond cleavage or full-on transfer of pairs of electrons, at best we say, okay, we've got a negative carbon. The positive carbon of the alkyl halide can't undergo a standard substitution reaction. So that would not be a valid product if we went under two electron transfer. It has to go under one electron transfer. Okay? So it's kind of a subtle thing. Again, you're not super responsible for it. It's just kind of neat. So let's move on. From, whoa, that was a bit excessive. I apologize. Let's slow that down a little bit. Okay? We can now go through and react our Grignard reagent with a variety of carbonyls. Okay? So if you see your Grignard reagent, Like above with the benzene ring, MGBR, right? Okay. What you should immediately do, okay, if not actually in your mind, erase the MGBR and put a negative next to your carbon. Because that is how this reagent is reacting. This is a negative carbon. Okay. What does that negative carbon need to find? An electrophile. Where's there an electrophile? 
there's only one carbon in this case, the carbon over carbonyl. We would exceed the octet on the carbon, so what happens? Breaks the pi bond. I have space, I do. We've got our oxygen with its lone pairs. All right? All right, now what happens? We'll need to do a proton transfer. But if we had protons in solution, wouldn't that have killed the Grignard reagent? This has to run as a two-step. So we'll add a step two where we add our H3O+. That then provides the hydrogen, and we'd end up with our final structure with an OH. Make sense? Okay. If we start with the formaldehyde, so two hydrogens connected to our carbonyl carbon, we end with a what type of alcohol? Classify the alcohol for me. Say that again, Wyatt? Primary. It's a primary alcohol. Okay. We start with an aldehyde with only one carbon, we'll end up with a primary alcohol at the end. Okay. What if I went through and, you know, really irritating, just said, okay, I'm not going to be a primary alcohol or a formaldehyde. I'm going to switch now to acetaldehyde. Okay. Well, crap, now everything's got to change, right? No. What happens? All I have to do is add that carbon to the structure. It isn't changing anything about the chemistry. The Grignard is still attacking the electrophilic carbon of the carbonyl. Okay? So we're still doing that nucleophilic addition. Okay? The alcohol I end up with now is not a primary, it's secondary. Because where the alcohol is connected, that carbon is connected to two other carbons. Okay? Well, let's be extra irritating, and let's go ahead and draw on, doo -doo -doo. let me give it a mister, a little body there, and there's his tail. Okay, we're going to pretend that's a mouse, All right? <laughs> How does that then change our answer? How does that change any of the chemistry? It doesn't. Okay, what just has to happen is at the very end, I then have to go through and draw my little roadkill mouse. <laughs> that actually wasn't half bad. Okay, and there's your little whiskers, right? Okay. Focus on where the chemistry is occurring, not the rest of the structure. Everybody will look at it and go, oh my god, that structure is massive, I can't possibly answer this question. But it's, it's just the carbonyl that's reacting. I don't care if there's a dead mouse attached to it. I just care that there's a carbonyl there. Okay? So first keep your focus there. Address your answers. Make sense? Okay. So that's what all of this then shows. Starting with formaldehyde, ending with a primary alcohol, starting with an aldehyde, getting a secondary, and starting with a ketone and getting uh, a tertiary alcohol. Are there other carbonyls that the Grignard could add to? Let's say we've already talked about. What were these two carbonyls? Sam knows the bottom one. Because no one else got that one, I'll go ahead and write that one up. An acyl chloride. What's the top one? It's an ester. Do those have carbonyls? Yes. Would we expect these to react with Grignard reagents? Yes. Okay. These have a bit of a problem, though. What was the extra piece of information that the ester and the acyl chloride brought in? 
leaving groups. So once we've done a single addition and a leaving group leaves, what would we still have left? A carbonyl, which means it could react a second time. So again, that's foreshadowing. We aren't going to draw out that mechanism because, again, that's a nucleophilic uh, addition elimination followed by a nucleophilic addition. We're officially just nucleophilic additions right now. Okay? Just want you to at least consider it. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. Uh, tell me what you get for your answers. Right, again, if you look at that one, I just want to draw attention to the top one here. Most people seem to lose this one. If you draw out the Lewis structure for CO2, that helps to call attention to that polar pi bond. CO2 does act as a polar pi bond. It can react with the Grignard reagent. Okay. Um, it only reacts with one of them, not the other, which is why we end up with the carboxylic acid okay, at the end. Okay. So let's erase all of those. So now the top one, what did I draw as the answer? The exact same thing. Why would I draw the exact same thing? Okay. Both screens can show that pretty cleanly. What's out there? An alcohol. And alcohols are protic. Because it's protic, what happens? CH3. The CH3 reacts with that hydrogen. The other product is actually CH4. So we are having a reaction occur here. The Grignard reagent pulls a hydrogen off of our structure. Okay? We then put the hydrogen back on in step two. And we end up saying no reaction has occurred. Okay? When in actuality, if we ran this reaction, we would see methane come bubbling out of the reaction. Okay? So you have to watch out for those acidic hydrogens. Okay? We could do the same thing back with sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Okay? If I had the structure, this is a horrible example, but let's just say we did this. Okay? And I wanted to reduce that right, to that situation. Well, it's just a standard reduction, right? Right? Lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride should do that step. Only sodium borohydride works in the upper right-hand corner. Why? That protic hydrogen would kill lithium aluminum hydride. We don't get the hydride addition. Okay? So we can largely ignore the rest of our structure. We just have to make sure there aren't other important functional groups in there that could mess with our results. The bottom one, what's happening with the bottom one? Well, we have a nitrile that's still a polar pi bond. So we pretend to clear all that away. The Grignard will still come in and react, break that open. The Grignard is not as active as lithium aluminum hydride, which means that after we do the addition once, okay, we're stuck with N minus. Okay, so it stalls there. We then follow that up with step two with a protic solvent, which we'll go through and protonate. Notice the protic solvent used is not H3O+. Because if I use H3O+, I get a different answer. Okay? Because it doesn't just protonate. It actually does another nucleophilic addition, which we'll talk about in Chapter 18. Okay? Uh, I think, yeah, I think we should be doing that in Chapter 18. Okay? But because I use that protic solvent instead of H water, I'm okay, and I would end at the amine. Okay? Uh, feasible Grignard reagents. This is just kind of a quick summary of it. Okay? We can look at the top, because your textbook's done a decent job of showing this. All of those are decent Grignard reagents. Okay? So they all have a carbon that would be nucleophilic. And that's what they're trying to show in red. These are all potentials for Grignard reagents. Okay? You can even put it on a vinylic position, okay? or the benzene ring itself. Okay? All of those are fair game. The ones below are not. Well, isn't that carbon right at the beginning? 
Isn't that roughly the same thing as, say, that one? Why is the bottom one not working, but the top one does? Because there's an alcohol in it. It has that acidic alcohol. Okay. And the next one, I still have the Grignard reagent. Okay. That's the same thing as that one. Why does the bottom one not work? They're highlighting it for you. It's the acidic car. Well, that's not acidic. What is it? It's electrophilic. It'll end up reacting with itself. Okay? And that's what they're trying to show with the rest of these. Okay? The next one will react with itself. How? Uh, we could do a nucleophile. But instead, it's actually going to be a base. We could do an elimination. The last one, why is the last one problematic? That's electrophilic. That's a three-membered ring. Three-membered rings aren't stable. That will break open. So we don't want to throw Grignards or form Grignards in a structure that have epoxides. Okay. And I believe that is all of our, don't worry about that quiz, all of our Grignards, so I'm happy with that. We'll talk about Wittig reactions on Monday. Uh, the Wittig, I think, is a bit tricky but kind of neat, so I would recommend that you at least attempt to read the textbook on that to make sure you've got a baseline idea behind it. Um, but it is kind of cool because you can do some neat stuff with it.